Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and the atmosphere in BODW is always very good. Um, yes, the connection between the city, culture, and creativity was begun to be made probably about 25 years ago, and obviously what we've just heard from Michael is an expression of that in its full flourishing whatever we're about to see in the next coming years. Um, so let's take a closer look at this whole issue. And I want to just take you on a bit of a journey, um, but play also a bit of a thought experiment, which you'll see uh, in a minute. Now, one of the things that's quite interesting is the cities we love, as someone said, we cannot build anymore because the economic dynamics that exist seem to push us away from that. And that's quite interesting. I do still think, though, there is the potential to sort of reclaim the sort of good virtues of the great city. And for many years, I've been asking people to give me adjectives and words, what for them describe a city that is really, I don't know, fulfilling, good, creative, etc. And these are the sort of words people say, and you'll be well acquainted with them. Um, and they're all very easy to say, but actually, in reality, not that easy to do. And it does require sort of courage from all the sort of interest groups and so on that make up a city to really have some sort of key principles that they push through as they're sort of building infrastructure and so on. And as you know, there was the Shanghai Expo, which was all about better cities, better life. And this question of what is the great city? What can cities become? What can they become like in the future has been a central question that everybody's asking. How do you blend the nature and the city together in ways that are fulfilling and so on? And many people say that people just don't dare to have sort of big ideas around the city and really to put things together in a way that, that, that is satisfactory for all types of people who come together, of course, in a city. And I do think there are some sort of principles that are valid through time and cross-culturally that, that, that probably are true. And one of the, they're probably five, I would say, and the first is really that sense that a city, a great city, needs some sort of anchorage. Anchorage means, I suppose, let's call it heritage, if you like, or tradition, or something that has a basis uh, that you have a sense of where you come from. The second point, though, is very much the opposite of that, which is, is there a sense of possibility, can do, um, stimulation, buzz, all of that, equally in that place that provides some sense of anchorage? And thirdly, there's, of course, the question of connection. Connection of different people, different cultures and so on, but also connection in all the physical and other virtual senses that, that, that make a place interesting for, for people. So that's the third element. The fourth, you might say, is a city is great when you feel that you can self-realize yourself in some sort of sense. That may be through education, but it can be in all sorts of other ways. Really trying to be the best that you can be is perhaps the fourth element. And the fifth is really that sense of occasional inspiration. Inspiration obviously comes in many forms. It could be artistic inspiration, but it also could be you know, other forms of spiritual inspiration, whatever that is. But anyway, inspiration might be the fifth. Now, why do we, in all of this context, talk about creativity? What, why has that suddenly come up in the agenda? Well, I think, really, it's so important because it's about adaptability and so on. And of course, the word seems for many, when it really rose up the agenda 10, 15, 20 years ago, people started saying, what's all this vague stuff about creativity? What the hell are you talking about? But I do think it's really, in terms of adaptability and resilience of a city, a question of survival. And many people say it's really quite urgent. I'm not quite saying it's one minute to midnight, but you get the general idea. I think graffiti is always very useful to tell you what's going on in the world because it sort of tells you a, a story. Now, of course, cities have always been creative. Um, they've always been the laboratory for the solution of the problems of their own creation. This happens to be, you know, Brunelleschi in Florence, the cathedral. Obviously, it's creative trying to put that together or here's the Sagrada Familia inside. 
The only difference I would say between then and now is really that we're very self-consciously aware that this thing, this attitude, this flexibility of mind and all of that that we associate with creativity is actually a resource, a currency. It's a sort of currency, whether it's more than money, I don't know, but it's certainly one of the resources that we can use. Now, it's interesting, for many years, people and those in the audience will all know that, people, have having to, people like you have had to argue, what's the value of, let's say, the project that Michael's doing? What's the value of art? What's the value of design? What's the value of soft thinking? What's the value of creativity? I never answer that question anymore, because that means that the person who's asking you that question is really asking you to justify your existence by them saying, what is the value? I always ask the other question, what's the cost of not? What's the cost of not being culturally literate? What's the cost of not being design aware? What's the cost of being unimaginative? And that's interesting because that other person who's not interested in those things, you can just ask them why. The shoe is on the other foot, in other words. And I suppose the key element that I've realized over the last period is actually before we can even talk about creativity and those things, we actually need to be talking about curiosity and places, cities, generating the conditions whereby people can think, plan, and act with imagination. Because out of that curiosity, which I think is the first point, if there's a culture of curiosity in a place, we might have some imaginative ideas of some sort or imagination, out of which creative ideas flow, some of which are good, some of which are bad, and out of which you might get an invention, and ultimately, when it's applied, an innovation. And that then leads to that cycle. So that's the way I tend to, 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 to look at things. Now, of course, we all know there have been dramatic transformations around the world and so on. And the world, in one way or another, you could say, is a smaller place than it was before. And that, of course, is true. And some of these places, of course, are going downhill. You know, I come from Britain. Is it going uphill, downhill? Probably more downhill, I'm sorry to say. Other places, of course, going uphill. Um, and within that uphill, the younger person here, this young Chinese woman, looks much more confident than the older guy. But all of this, the world is one place, of course has interesting ramifications in terms of global culture and the fact of how the identity of particular places evolves. And of course there's the other issues that I'm sure has been discussed, that every city is trying to be magnetic and in that becoming magnetic or being more magnetic, they obviously want expertise, skills, aspirant people, talent, whatever you want to call it. Now this is my little thought experiment. City 0.0 is in a sense that city that we had that past. I've left that blank for the moment about Hong Kong's past. There's lot, so much left of it. But what we've really encountered is, of course, the City 1.0. So many of our cities are really hardware-driven. They've really been built according to the urban engineering paradigm, as if the city were a machine. And of course, that's very functional, but often, I mean, you'll recognize where this is, the housing looks more like warehousing and so on. And it may fulfill people's functional needs to some extent, especially if you put a nice plant in front of the window and so on. But these places can often be completely unsatisfactory from an emotional perspective. This is an Australian city, I won't tell you where, Michael, but I lived here for about eight weeks. And so I got the sense that whoever did this wasn't sort of really interested in how I got from A to B. Um, and of course, there are modern versions of this. This is Dubai. I mean, it's a bit like the film Metropolis. Uh, of course, the adverts tend to show that it's green and so on. But this is the reality. It's very difficult to walk around. Many of those words you saw earlier are difficult to achieve in this sort of context. Now, I'm not saying there's a problem with engineering. Engineering is fantastic. Things have to stand out. The way you're building that new land is an engineering project par excellence. It's just really that that's not the only mindset that should be determining how we live in our cities today. 
And of course, linked to that is a sort of cultural approach, which I'm calling Culture 1.0, which has its own repertoire. And you know what that repertoire is. It's sort of a series of institutions that are open from 7 to 10, where the performance is on, and the rest of the time they're closed, the sort of isolated islands in the middle of nowhere. And inside them, there may be interesting things happening. But you, as a citizen, and just moving around the city, can't experience that. And part of that repertoire is, of course, things like festivals and so on, as well as public art. And public art is usually red. I don't know, I mean, I understand that red's a color you love in China, but also in Europe, sort of 80% of public art seems to be red. Why no yellow? Why no green? Anyway, that's just a, another question. But that's all part of this uh, repertoire of what I'm calling 1.0. And this is a project uh, in Lisbon, which cost 50 million euros. And I kept on asking when I went around it, and it was basically empty, what would have happened had that investment been put into the talents, the creative talents of its own people? Would it have had a greater impact or a lesser one? And so what we've got there with this let's call it this 1.0, is the city as a machine, the siloed organization. You're treating the city as if it's a, a facilities management problem. So therefore, more people have also said, look, does this work? Is there another way of dealing with that? And have said, let's drag the old thinking of cities out and think afresh. And because you wanted me to bring in Belgium, this is in Ghent, a planning bureau. So I just tried to bring in Belgium, the Belgian spirit. And they have clearly said there may be another way. And 2.0, we might call the city of soft urbanism, where basically the hardware and software thinking happens simultaneously. The people involved in these two varieties of things have equal status. In 1.0, it's those people who think in that sort of bricks and mortar way that are in charge. In this 2.0, there's a better balance. Because, of course, the city is primarily an emotional experience. That's the first experience we have of it. And if the city says yes and feels like a yes city, all sorts of other possibilities emerge and can come to fruition. And here in the city, we recognize again that the essence of cities is really about transaction, exchange, people coming together in a variety of ways and doing things that are both satisfactory personally, but also maybe to do with their work. And here words are coming into the vocabulary like atmospherics and so on, which are relatively new. And you can see lots of examples of this. This was probably talked about before, Chonggye Chong in Seoul, which had this motorway. It was got rid of. It's become perhaps one of the most predominant meeting points in Seoul. And when the mayor was asked, where did the cars go? I seem to remember him saying something like, I don't know. And that just proves that you can actually get rid of a lot of infrastructure. And that's happening in many places, like here, this is Chicago's Millennium Park, which was that and became that. So you can see the sort of transformations that are happening all over the world, which is retrofitting classic infrastructure from the 1.0 city into a 2.0 city, which has a much greater sensory satisfaction this is obviously the High Line in New York, and this is near Times Square, where people are recapturing the street in a variety of ways. And here in Paris, again, you see the sort of soft infrastructure merging with the card. In terms of culture, the emphasis then becomes much more on things like the creative economy, the cultural industries and so on, and classic examples are all the warehouses all over the world that are incubation centers, like here in Rotterdam. There are six companies working here. It's the flexibility, the fact that you're blending old and new together that attracts. And of course, it allows the sort of economy, that new economy, to be operate much more easily than a classic corporate context. 
And a couple of Dutch examples here. This is a museum which looks like a museum of textiles, and you might say, do I want to see another textile museum? But in fact, this museum is a showcase of creating new products out of machinery, some old and some new. So the shop is a showcase of new inventions created by artists and others um, in a museum setting. So that's redefining what a museum is. Or here, I think, is an interesting social housing project in Arnhem, again, in the Belgian Dutch region, lots of designers, as we all know, and fashion is a big thing. But there, the social housing policy was to leave the social housing on top, but to allow the students coming out of that university both a working space and a showcase, a shop. And this area has suddenly, as you can see, revitalized to that simple social housing uh, policy. The third, though, example I'm giving here is Istanbul. This was the classic sort of hub of music creation, selling, and all of those things together. Agents were there and so on. And this is a classic dilemma. It's become very popular. That was three years ago. Now, this was two months ago. It's sort of closed. And what's coming in here, of course, is a fashion shop. A fashion shop selling some brand that we may or may not know. So one of the dilemmas of this 2.0 is, of course, this obsession we have with branding and brands, which, of course, are important at some level, and also trying to revalue and give more value to the ordinary, in this case, shoes. This is Florence. Uh, uh, Salvatore Ferragamo produces shoes. He produced them from Marilyn Monroe. So they've got a museum where, of course, there's an exhibition about Marilyn Monroe. Nothing wrong with that, but it's just that interconnection between trying to make consuming things more interesting. Nearby is the Gucci Museum, doing it with bags and so on. And most interestingly, or perhaps most well-known, is the way Louis Vuitton used Yoyo -Yo Kusama to, in a sense, sell all their range last year, which apparently was the most successful of all. So that's really about the shopping thing. And this is Banksy subverting a museum in Bristol. And anyway, you get the general idea. And part of that, of course, is spectacular architecture of various sorts. And here, I believe, is a new Herzog de Meuron thing in Hamburg, uh, which is going to be the concert hall and 13 stories of, of apartments. Again, like many of these things, it's not Herzog de Meuron's fault, by the way, but the budget has gone way over that it was going to be. And this is an interesting image I took in Zurich, which is another Renaissance hotel, not the one here. And this is all the knowledge economy moving in. But one guy said, I want to keep my old house. And in the same writing as Renaissance, put resistance. And in a sense, this is the classic dilemma that in a sense we all face in terms of urban development. So this city is more organic, it focuses on the public realm, it's more emphasizing partnerships to make things happen, but it also spectacularizes the city. The 3.0 city is perhaps about something different. It's about not this old way of thinking about the economy, one producer, one idea, one distributor going to households. It's more about understanding the way that small SMEs, there's the World SME Conference happening here simultaneously, that build into networks and alliances that come together with interesting new supply chains that distribute in all sorts of different formats to households and then come back together again. And that graphic description of this different world is very much about the here-there phenomenon, and I'm sure many of you are simultaneously being somewhere else on your mobile and perhaps listening or not. And it's where that, again, that sense of flexibility has reached a completely new level or nomadic lifestyle here. This is Amsterdam, people having their offices in a container that will move, very much about the pop-up culture, and even this office here, this is a German invention, an office, which you can carry around with you like a dog. I don't know if they do, but you can, in fact, pull it around with you. But anyway, it's just emphasizing this question of flexibility. 
And that's, of course, based on the whole notion of open source, open data movement, transparency, and so on, and a general level of, let's say, openness. And that has a cultural version as well. And I'll just go back for a second to that, which is really where we're much more concerned also about people making and creating their own culture. I'll just give one example. This is in Helsinki. And in 2011, on the 5th of August, someone did a social media campaign because it was so difficult to create restaurants and said, on this day, we will create restaurants. And 80 restaurants suddenly sprung up all over the streets. This was a provocation to the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy was so surprised and said, actually, this is a bloody good idea. And since then, this has become one of the major themes in the Nordic countries of just opening restaurants onto the streets on certain days of the year. So that's a different sort of culture, which is very much reflected also in the TEDx approach to life as well. So therefore, the city 3.0 and cultural 3.0 is different. It has a different physicality about it. It also has a different operating dynamic. And if you were to simplify in terms of words, you're seeing the city as a living organism. It's more about co-creation, co-making, shaping together, rethinking even the ethical framework, which I'll become to in a minute. It's a new sort of urbanity. It's seamless, smart, and so on. But that, in part, is the essence, I think, of what makes a livable city. It's a combination of that sense of intimacy that we often see and want and desire sometimes, combined with that opposite, which we might call a sort of cosmopolitanism as well. But then, therefore, what is the new urbanite of the 21st century? What are the priorities they have? What do they like doing? What, what, what is it? What should they have? And I believe, obviously, we all have some sense of right to the city, but also responsibility for it. Now, if we just look at that for a moment, I've added the word civic, old-fashioned word, I know, civic, very 50s, civic urbanity. And I think somehow the me and us of the city needs to come together again. The city's not just there to perform for us as passive individuals. And there are probably seven elements of that which are really crucial. The first is the shared commons, that sense that there's stuff that belongs to all of us. And simply, that's partly, obviously, public space in various ways that we all, of course, are aware of. The fact that this is flexible, this is Bryant Park in New York, you shape it and make it as you wish. It's to do with libraries and things of that nature. The second is, I suppose, the whole thing about interculturalism, which is the big, one of the central issues of our time. The fact that we need to be culturally literate, understand the other and so on. And of course, so often, this is seen as sort of the stuff that you deal with after you've dealt with the main course. But I'm, of course, saying it's central. And indeed, it's central. The cultural component, the cultural identity, how we are, is either a benefit or a resource, but also can be an obstacle in terms of moving forward. And you can see this in many places. I mean, this happens to be, again, Lisbon, this sense of tolerance and so on, because by definition, in a globalized world, there will be people of difference. The next component is really that thing about inequality. If you look at the relationship between those countries in the world that have the highest level of innovation, a lot of them are in the Nordic countries, they have the highest level of equality. So equality, at some sense, is a real force for innovation in one way or another. Because what that's about is harnessing the collective intelligence of a group, a city, a country, and so on, and putting it together in some sort of way to create interesting solutions. Of course, then, there's eco-consciousness. And how you see that is quite interesting. This is Malmo. You've got Sweden next year. So let's ha have some Swedish examples where you've got the icon Calatrava, but you've also got housing there that is both social housing and ordinary middle class housing together. But most importantly, it's a carbon neutral area. 
partly to do with windmills, but also because of the way it all works. And the city is communicating itself, not by having a sign saying, be green, but by just the way you can see it operating. You can, of course, think of, for example, this UK example in London, where the aesthetics itself is different. And so clearly, green aesthetics will be a new thing. Then there is the issue, and I've added a word, healthy in front of urban planning. If urban planning always asks itself the question, I'm doing some planning, but is it making me feel healthy, would be an interesting point. And I remember being in the States, and I saw this thing that said National Walking Day, and I thought, fantastic, National Walking Day in the States? Yes, ah, so, right. Now, the problem here is clearly that the city is so created that you can't walk, so you have to buy a machine to walk, which, of course, you get the drift. I don't need to spell that out. But also, healthy urban planning is also about mental health. This is a courthouse in Canada, again, a nameless city, where what it looks like makes you feel guilty before you are proved innocent as distinct from the Adelaide Courthouse, which broadly is fine, you go inside, there's artwork everywhere, so before you're being punished, you can basically look at some art. So these are differences in approach. Then there is the question of the aesthetic responsibility. I think ad, uh, investors and others have to have some sense of that responsibility to their environment, because the pinpricks of ugliness are there forever. Now, this is an interesting example from Helsinki, voted the ugliest building in the city and the most beautiful. Why? Because it's Alvar Aalto. He's the god of Finland, as you know. But the point I'm really making, that doesn't matter. At least we're discussing aesthetics. And then there's creative city making, which I've discussed already, which is essentially about finding interesting solutions to problems and opportunities. And finally, this is only going to work if there's a reinvigorated democracy. We've invented so many new technologies and everything else, but democracy has been actually roughly the same for several hundred years. And this is about rethinking the, uh, the way regulations work and so on. Now, finally, a few words about this measuring the pulse of your city in a sort of acupunctural way. Bill Bauer said to us, can you measure the creative ecosystem of a city? We know we're innovative, but we're not sure we're creative. Interesting question. And what we do there is an internal assessment where people assess themselves combined with an external one, which comes up with some quite interesting results. And basically, it goes through four things. Can you identify and nurture creativity and, uh, and all of that? How do you do that? How well is that doing? How is it supported and enabled? How is it exploited and harnessed? And finally, how is it expressed in the lived experience of the city? The first city we did was not was Bilbao, but uh, one of the first was Ghent. Sorry, I'm con constantly trying to bring in Belgium. Anyway, they did very well on uh, this assessment. And the first thing in terms of this nurturing is the primary domain is really a, the level of openness. And that can, of course, be assessed in various ways. Once that's there, that really sets everything in motion. The second element in this nurturing is about the learning landscape. Not only universities, but also other things that are to do with professional learning and so on. In terms of the supporting and enabling, it's about the political public framework. Has that got a regulatory system, an incentive system, that fosters the uh, experimentation and things like that? Is it strategically principled, but tactically flexible? Part of that, of course, is to do with strategic thinking ahead. Less the ordinary leader who does that, more the leader who thinks a bit into the future. And the key point there is this question of agility, knowing where you're going, but realizing you need to be flexible to get there. And part of that, again, is this question also of professionalism. It's all very well having ideas, the question is, are they actually being implemented? Very many places are professional, but not effective also, because they may not be doing the right thing. In terms of harnessing and exploiting, 
The domain we explore there is obviously to do with incuba incubation of various types. And here, the whole communication system, in every sense of communication between people, transport, all of those things, virtual communication together, are incredibly important. You often find places have good communication systems, but bad networking systems, for example. And then finally, finally, how is that lived and expressed? What is the distinctiveness, the level of distinctiveness and expressiveness in this city? Is it allowed to come out or is it blocked in various ways? And here, one element is, of course, the place and how it is being made. Often places have very good historic fabric, but what's happening new is less good than it could be. So that's another domain. The third element and the final element of all of this is the typical things about livability, facilities, all of those things together. So in conclusion, to make all of this work, it needs to all be beyond the silo. I remember wearing one of those at a conference for half an hour and you realized that being in a silo is a bit oppressive. So that's probably the central message. And also this following one. Hong Kong should ask itself, is this a city of projects? A project makes money on its own, but might be negative in terms of the lack of creative capital it creates and so on. Or is the project the city? Is the city the project, or is this a city of projects? I know easy to say, but difficult to do. So finally, the city, as Plato said, is a work of art. I would add a living work of art. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thanks very much, Charles. You've, uh, you've packed quite a bit in there. In fact, you packed so much in that we're way over time. OK, well, uh, I'll leave. So, <laughs> well, I, 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 I've been told, unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions, but I'm going to ask you just one question anyway. I mean, you've, you've given a very inspiring talk, um, painting this wonderful image of sort of this uh, idealized, uh, progressive, enlightened, um, very Scandinavian <laughs> in, in, in some ways city. Uh, one, one, one ingredient that I didn't see, though, which, and, and, and I'm wondering how sort of out of fashion uh, you think this is uh, these days, but is the idea of friction. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I think one of the wonderful... Important. Yes. Fr friction tension obviously is important. I mean, in general, this whole creativity agenda is, in fact, quite f full of friction. I mean, people feel generally unrelaxed about it. So even though I think it's necessary, by definition, even talking about this creates friction because it's about, uh, about the old and the new always bumping into each other. So tension is all part of that story. OK, great. So uh, I mean, as, as we in Hong Kong move from this sort of highly regulated, highly, uh, highly planned uh, city 1.0 into the sort of culture 2.0, 2.3, uh, phase. It, it, we, uh, we're, we're looking forward to seeing what, what your further observations are and, and, and uh, with, with all the frictions and, and, and so on that, that will likely be part of that as well, uh, which is in many ways uh, necessary uh, to a, dy uh, a dynamic city. You, you need, uh, a friction is part of the creativity of, of a city as well. So, I, so that's one lesson I learned from your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.